<laughs> don't get any ideas that I'm fast and loose. I don't, I don't do this with every crowd. <laughs> How are you tonight? <laughs> okay. Got a good show? Yeah. Edward, where's Doc, by the way? I He's in uh, Las Vegas. Is he working up there, Tom? Yes, sir. Sands Hotel. How are you tonight, Tom? Very well. Good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Oh. How are the folks? Folks are fine. How are your folks? They're fine, thanks. Oh. They said say hello. <laughs> Sounds like a letter from camp, doesn't it? <laughs> Dear Mom, how are you? Uh, I, I like Tommy, I really do. Fine musician, one of the great arrangers in, in our business, but a little naive, I guess would be the word. How naive is he? <laughs> Very good. Thank you, sir. Well, I'll <laughs> There goes your job. <laughs> Tommy went to the drugstore the other day and had to show him his ID to buy adult strength aspirin. I mean, that's... <laughs> we have, uh, from time to time, we give a nightly tip for tourists. If you're out here on vacation and uh, we don't want you to get uh, taken advantage of, uh, if you're shopping along Hollywood Boulevard, that's kind of strange up there, um, stay away from any antique shop that is selling Louis XIV raincoats. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get out the Mickey Mouse costume? And we'll do that. I know why you're all a little depressed today. You read the papers today, right? There's no good news in the papers. The price of food, up. Something like going to go up 10% this year. Um, have you ever noticed, incidentally, if you go to a supermarket, right at the checkout stand, they got all the razor blades? <laughs> Hanging on those little... The reason for that is once you get the bill, you can order the blades and just go like that and have it done. Meat is so expensive these days. Yes. You need a connection to buy an ounce of ground round. Did you know that? <laughs> okay, you don't need a connection. Well, let's go back to Washington. That's where all the humor is and see what's happening politically. Uh, there is a new controversy going on in Washington. Have you heard about President Carter feuding with Ben Bradley? Ben Bradley is the uh, managing editor of the Washington Post... And uh, President Carter called a press conference, I guess early today or last night, and um, had all the reporters come over, and he denied a published report from the Washington Post that uh, said that there was going to be a freeze put on the SALT negotiations. That's what the Post reported, and uh, Carter was fuming, actually fuming. You could see the veins standing out in his teeth. <laughs> Look, if you're not sure, we'll take a vote and all get together. And if there's a majority, then you can applaud the joke. But I hate this kind of, you know, outlying stuff. Uh, no, but the president is not taking this lying down. He's going to put economic pressure on the Washington Post. Uh, Carter says he's going to cancel his job wanted ad that was going to run in 1980. No, 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 no. Carter's having some problems. First, cousin Hugh Carter attacked him. You know, Cousin Hugh came out with a book. And then General Singlaub attacked President Carter's uh, foreign policy and defense. And now the Washington Post is attacking. I, I feel sorry for Jimmy. Last time he was seen, his uh, head was sticking out of a window of the Oval Office. And he was yelling, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. That's, that's sad. Okay, you got it. All right. Remember a few years ago when they caught the Russians bugging the American embassy? They had a microphone, I think, planted in the great seal of the United States on the wall. Well, according to the papers yesterday, they caught the Russians again with a lot of electronic, very sensitive surveillance gear uh, in the American embassy. Now, that's not unusual. Let's face it, right? The Cold War goes on all the time, has for years. Their side does what they have to do. Our side does what we have to do. And right now, the Russians are busy bugging our embassy in an effort to find out what President Carter is doing. And the U.S. is busy bugging the Russian embassy to find out what President Carter is doing. <laughs> so it uh, works both ways. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be funny if the Russians leaked that information to the Washington Post? <laughs> when, they, uh, when they confronted the uh, Russians with this, the Russians came up with a rather flimsy excuse. Apparently, the Americans asked why the microphones were planted in the chimney. That's where they were. The Russians said they were trying to find out if there really was a Santa Claus. <laughs> which I thought was a very weak excuse. <laughs> also, possibly a very weak joke, I'm not sure. 
No, the, the State Department said the listening devices were an intelligence gathering service. Now, there's kind of a contradiction right there, isn't there? There hasn't been a lot of intelligence in the State Department for a number of years. <laughs> This section seems to figure them out and then tells people and it, uh, there's a very sharp group right up in here and they say and then it moves across. Uh, but obviously they have moved over here. It's like walking a tightrope tonight, isn't it? What else? Oh, Susan Ford was in the news today. She said her father, Gerald Ford, is still has a desire for the job. <laughs> oh, sit down, Jerry. Uh, no, she says... <laughs> Susan says that her father may run again. I think you can tell that Ford's getting to, ready to run in 1980. He just asked Senator Ed Muskie to be his technical advisor on where Poland is. So I think he's... Uh... While we're on politics, um, we've got a race coming about here, you know, and former chief of police Ed Davis came up with a rather interesting statement. He's, the, uh, he's running for the nomination, and he said if he is elected governor of California, he will not run for president of the United States like his predecessors. I don't know if you know much about Ed Davis. He was a good cop, and I would guess you would call him Conservative? <laughs> um, Ultra-conservative. He's just, he's just a, a little to the right of the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> uh, just, but Ed Davis was conservative from the day he was born. His mother complained he only nursed on the right. Did you know that? All right, here's some more bad news for you. It seems that every day the Fe Food and Drug Administration comes out with something else that can cause some terrible disease, usually linked to cancer. Uh, and today it was suggested that sandwiches, have you, did you read this, that are sold on the Amtrak trains <laughs> may cause botulism poisoning. Isn't that fun? And I understand that victims will die two hours after they're supposed to. <laughs> Okay, are you ready for today's weird news item? Two men were arrested for smuggling three tons of marijuana inside sacks of manure. Now, uh, that's... <laughs> the way they got wise, you know, they have dogs that sniff out drugs, and they saw the dogs holding their noses. <laughs> I understand one of the farmer, uh, some farmer got a sack of that by mistake and the crops are rotating by themselves. <laughs> it's uh, weird. Uh, it's a weird idea. You don't use zigzag paper with that. You, use, you roll it in Charmin. <laughs> uh, I understand you smoke one joint of that and you listen to stereo music and have an insane desire to scrape your shoe. Probably not true. Anyway, we have... We got to you, didn't we? All right, we got a good show now. We have James Coco, Kelly Monteith, Barbara Hauer, and uh, I think for the third year, we have some of the finalists, and we've had great fun with this, from, the, uh, from Piedmont, California, in the annual uh, bird calling contest up there, and it's fascinating. It'll be a lot of fun. So thanks for coming, and we'll be with you in... Are we back already? <laughs> All right. Friday night. Got anything to report? What are you going to do this weekend? I'm going to be in town. If you're not nice, traveling, I'm not you're traveling, traveling. I am here. How about you? I'm going to be in town. Great. But next uh, Friday, I, I, I play somewhere. You're in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island. Cohasset, or no? Is it Cohasset? No, we're back in Warwick, Rhode Island. Warwick, Rhode Island. We do two shows there. Yeah, never, never played there. Everybody's been there since it's wonderful. We do two shows on a Friday. This coming Friday, it's that would be about the round, eighth, yeah. yeah, and two on uh, June 9th, right, and one on Sunday, which I believe is—is is that the eighth, ninth, and tenth, or ninth, tenth, and eleventh? That's the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. No, it can't be the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. No, it's the ninth, tenth, and eleventh. 
Well, you just changed because no, I said it's that. The 10th, 11th, and 12th. Today's the second. A week from that would be... Thursday is the 8th. Friday is the 9th. It's the 9th, 10th, and 11th. That's right. You, you said the 8th, 9th, and 10th. But you said the 10th, 11th, and 12th. That's right. It's right in between there. I'm right in between. <laughs> anyway, we'll be there with Phyllis yeah. McGuire. And... All right. You know what this is? I have no idea. And if I did, it would wreck what you're going to do. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> um, out here in California, you probably know about it, because I think 60 Minutes even did a, a segment on it. They have a couple of interesting propositions on the ballot called Proposition 8 and Proposition 13. Uh, Proposition 13 has to do with a tax initiative to lower, I guess, cut property property taxes almost in half. And it is one of the most controversial issues that's ever faced the voters. And if it passes here, there's probably going to be a tax revolt all over the country because people are getting tired of paying too many taxes. Uh, and if it passes, it's estimated now, we're not, I'm not going to take any side in this at all, for or against it. But its opponents say that uh, California will lose uh, something like $22 billion in revenues over the next three years. Other people say that's not true. Um, in Los Angeles County, they say it'll shrink by almost a billion dollars. Again, the proponents say there are not going to be that many cuts in this scare tactic, so you can take your own yeah. judgment of that. So to get ready for it, the county has prepared an alternative budget did you know that? No. For the proposed 1978-79 Proposition 13 alternative budget. In other words, apparently, that if Proposition 13 goes through, they're saying they have to make a lot of cuts, right? Mm -hmm. But we're not going to take sides on this. But we just want to give you some idea. And also, we're not going to read this. Oh, well, that's good news. Look at this. Yeah. You'd never make it to Rhode Island. No. On the 9th, 10th, and 11th. But uh, <sighs> if, they had to, if they have to skimp along... On a really austere budget, austere, austere, yeah. right? Severe. Here are some of the cutbacks and some of the things that may go into effect that they did not have. You mean they left out? They did. I read this. Everything this in the world. I read through this. You this could afternoon. possibly have was not in that. That's right. What did you bring it in for? I, I don't know. Just. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> what are you doing? A bit? Pays. Fuck it. Pays. <laughs> Please to have a prop, folks. That's right. I mean, when yeah. in doubt, have a prop. We have to start someplace. To hang on to. We've got to get into this some way, and this is a thing. Right. And I said, did you know what this is? And you said, no, no. and I kind of led into this. Yeah, all right. So in well, case... put it aside. In case they really have to skimp, yes. here are some of the possible things. <laughs> Not mentioned in that. For example, at public beaches, lifeguards will only be able to rescue swimmers whose names begin with the letters A through G. <laughs> Everybody that's, else, that's... Into the drink. That's right. And I suppose as you're out there, you say, Moskowitz, and they yeah. say, I'm sorry, yes. it's not in the right. it. <laughs> the sanitation department, sanitation, has announced a cutback in men and equipment of 90%. Mm. Now, to help Californians get rid of their garbage, each citizen will be issued one fly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, look, folks, I mean... Uh, the police department will cut down on bullets. In place, small flags that read, bang, bang. <laughs> well, you've seen those. They'll yes. pop out of the ends of revolvers, and the police will rely on the fugitive's sense of humor into playing dead. <laughs> it's, it's the honor system. It... <laughs> billy clubs, let's get into the police, will be manufactured with billy club helper. They will be made out of... 30% wood and 70% soybean. So they're not, they're not like the old yeah. oak maple. Yeah. Each policeman, this is really austere, yeah. will be required to put in his own gas in his own car, his own bullet in his gun, and pee in his whistle. You have to, <laughs> have to buy it. Absolutely. Inside. That's yeah. right. <laughs> that wasn't mentioned in there? It wasn't in here. Oh. <laughs> Zoos will be open only Monday through Friday. On Friday night, the cages will be opened and animals issued weekend passes. <laughs> the honor system. The only honor fair. System. Yes. Only fair. Sanitariums will be closed and mentally ill patients will be transferred to the stage of the gong show. <laughs> in our schools, this is... Mm. This is we're going to create Austere. some... Yes. In our schools, children will be bused to strange neighborhoods and left there. <laughs> Teachers of sex education will be dismissed, but the courses will continue to be taught by a man named Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Pre
prison chaplains will be laid off and last rites administered by parrots wearing collars. Forty <laughs> percent of all librarians will be fired, forcing the other sixty percent to stay home and shush themselves. <laughs> they will just sit there and shush. These are really severe cutbacks. Anyone dying within the city limits will be buried only up to the waist. <laughs> in, uh, in state forests, restrooms will be locked. However, there will be available pay trees. <laughs> to ensure privacy, bears will be issued blindfolds. <laughs> Old age pensioners will still receive checks but they will have to pick them up at the top of Mount Rushmore. <laughs> the fire department will be forced to eliminate all hoses, but we are not at liberty to tell you how they will put out the fires. <laughs> it involves something about um, keeping a keg of beer at the firehouse. <laughs> it's very involved. Anyway, they were not mentioned. Not not mentioned. None of those things will happen that we just read. But that's, it'll be interesting to see what happens out here. Because mm -hmm. there seems to be a, a trend around the country with people saying, hey, enough is enough. Yeah. And I suppose they've got to make up the money somewhere. Yeah. Probably, what, raise income taxes, sales tax, something right. like that. All right, we have with us tonight uh, James Coco, Kelly Monteith, Barbara Hauer, and the Bird Callers. And, but first, we'd like to welcome a new yeah. sponsor. Where are they? Well, I guess we don't oh. have anything to show them, but you're, you're familiar with their products. Yes. Duracell? Duracell batteries are joining us. So we will be back after a break. We have invited back. Thank you. We've invited us to join us again for the third year in a row, a very talented group of high school students. And they have just finished participating in the 15th annual bird calling contest at Piedmont High School in Piedmont, California. And uh, we've had this gentleman with us before. He's the founder and director of the contest, marine biologist and science teacher at the school, Leonard J. Waxdeck. Would you welcome him, please? This is getting to be a, an annual event for us here, and we look forward to it all the time. How many years has the contest officially uh, been going on? This is our third year on the show. Uh, yes, uh, the contest is, this was its 15th, 15th year. 15th year. 15th year, yes. How'd it go this year? Well, fine. It was very interesting. Our initial tryouts ran about 100, and uh, then uh, we eliminated about 60 callers and ended up with 40 finalists. Uh, this year, I had a problem. You, uh, I trust you've seen the program, Mr. Carson. I have to. And this year, we were without a gull. Our, Nobody did the goal this well, year? Well, no, not this year. This is the first time in about seven years. Our fullback, Doug Albo, was training his gull call, and he was doing a very nice job with it. And about midway through the year, his voice changed. So I... <laughs> That's one of the hazards, I suppose, isn't it? Well, yes. I decided uh, to make him chairman <coughs> of the selection committee for Miss Bird Calling. For Miss Bird Calling? Yes. So he didn't really lose... Well, too much in the long run. Well, yes and no. Uh, Doug uh, is a man of integrity and character, and this position placed him uh, in a situation where he was pressured by several of the fine young ladies who were seeking his favor for some of the votes. And on several occasions, uh -huh. he would come in and talk to me about this. That's the problem when you have to audition young ladies. You have to have certain rigid standards and discipline, none of which we have learned on this show. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, how do the students select what they're going to do? Uh, whatever they do best, I suppose, or if they have a, an affinity for doing? Well, the selection really is made. Uh, a student decides to do the call that he feels most comfortable with. And he'll usually pick this up uh, in nature. For example, this young boy that I encountered earlier this year who was talking to a dove each morning, and the, dog would an the dove would answer him. Uh, you're familiar with Senator McCrura, the morning dove, Mr. Carson. Yes. And, uh, Not on then, a first name basis, I guess. And but, uh, then. Uh, that's we your would, regular dove, huh? Yeah, the, the small uh, domestic dove. And uh, then uh, other people listen to records, and uh, in Piedmont, uh, many of the families hire personal coaches for the bird callers. Really uh, becoming that competitive? Oh, right? yes. And then we have our own coach, the Reverend. Clifford W. Pratt, who has been working with me for about nine or ten years. 
And he, is he an ornithologist? Uh, oh, yes. Or he's, uh, yes, and he's a very good uh, bird caller. Excellent. Did any of these junctures ever progress into this particular field at all? Uh, well, just from entering uh, into this contest? Yes, uh, years ago, the Huntley Brinkley newscast covered the bird calling, and one of the boys who appeared on it uh, uh, subsequently entered uh, television and uh, radio, and he's doing commercials now. And of course, we've developed some outstanding ornithologists. Right. I said orthodologist, or ornithologist. Ornithologist, right, yeah. yes. I was wondering, the, the bird watcher or bird collar, there's been kind of an image over the years of a little old lady, you know, weird little hat, sneakers going out, but it's, it's not that at all. A lot of people are interested in it, right? Uh, yes, uh, I, yes and no. I think that perhaps was the image, and I believe we discussed this once before. However, uh, for example, we had this year on our panel of judges, Gene Upshaw, the offensive all-pro <laughs> tackle with the Oakland Raiders, was on our panel of judges. Is he a bird uh, expert? Oh, yes, he, he certainly is. And we also had Wayne Walker, who was formerly an all-pro linebacker with the Detroit Lions. And both of these men spent a great deal of time bird watching. Those are not the kind of fellows you would kid about it at all, would no, you? I, no, I don't think so. Um, how many youngsters do we have tonight that are going to participate? Uh, we have five uh, youngsters, and uh, the, we have one group call, so we'll have four calls. How about the young fellow who was here? twice in a row. What was his name that had, we had so much fun with? In fact, we showed it on the, and I think his voice at the time was just undergoing a change. He came out, if I remember, to do the loon. Gavia Emir? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, that, uh, that youngster, Mark, uh, Mark Schweitzer, he appeared, I think, the first he year. He was wonderful. And his voice did crack, and then we invited <laughs> him back uh, with his sister, and they did a duet. And this year he was on the program, but we had a problem. He, uh, uh, he was preparing the... Uh, Canadian honker, Branta Canadensis. <laughs> Branta, Branta Canadensis. Branta Canadensis. That's, you, as you know, that's the a variety of the Western honker. Of course it is. And uh, it, the... It uh, just slipped my mind. I knew, I knew that and, this morning, but I... Yes, and what happened is the day of the contest, uh, he developed pneumonia, so we put him on the injured list, and he'll probably be back <laughs> with us next year. Well, I hope he's all right. Give him our yes. best. We're going to take a break, then we're going to have, I believe we have um, five... Uh, Yes. Young people here tonight, and this is really fascinating, and they do a remarkable job. So uh, we'll be right back after this commercial. We are back. If you just join us, we have James Coco, Kelly Monteith, and Barbara Howard, and we're talking to Leonard Waxdeck. And now you're going to meet these young people, who I guess all were finalists in this contest, or most of them. Yes. And um, they, they work hard at this, and this is a extremely difficult things that they do. Uh, so why don't you uh, introduce them, uh, Leonard, and we'll have the uh, first caller tonight. Uh, our first uh, caller is a rookie. Uh, he spends, uh, that is, he's a rookie because it's his first year calling. He spends most of his time on the football field at Piedmont High School where he, he is the defensive end. Uh, he's going to do a rendition of uh, Melospezia Melodia. No, I'm sorry, not Melospezia Melodia, Melospezia Linconi E, which is a little different. Ah. Melodia. I would have, sound, I would, oh, yes, I would have recognized the difference immediately. Yes, I know. <laughs> All right. And uh, I would like uh, you to meet uh, Brian Thomas Schlack. Brian Schlack. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight I will attempt to portray for you the call of the, Link of the Lincoln Sparrow, Melospiza Lincoln E. I first became interested in the ornithological field as a wee lad, spending many a summer at my grandmother's home in the picturesque dells of northern Wisconsin, swimming, fishing, and participating in the other activities of youth. <laughs> I heard my particular call one warm summer morning as I strolled... <laughs> <laughs> Hang in there. As I strolled through a glistening meadow, contemplating the deeper symbolic meaning of a Shakespearean sonnet, when over the pasture land floated a call that goes somewhat like this. Thank you. <laughs> I 
a giant flag. <laughs> Uh, okay, who's next? Well, our next caller is, is a veteran. He was with us about four or five years, was ready to give up this year, and I told him to hang in there. And as a matter of fact, he placed second. Uh, he's going to do the, the egret, the snowy egret, uh, Luco Fakes Thulin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like you to meet James Earl Bowman. James Bowman. <clears throat> Good evening. The call I'm going to do for you tonight is the snowy egret Lycofox Thula. The bird is snowy white in color and has bright yellow talons with which it lures fish for its food. Uh, the mating call, which I'm going to do for you tonight, is um, one that's kind of interesting. I've practiced it at the Bolinas Lagoon and have several, several times evoked immediate responses from very excited snowies. <laughs> <laughs> I can see where that's very effective. I almost, I almost wanted to mate with James myself. <laughs> very good. Uh, okay. More? Yes, what's next? <laughs> our, our next caller is a beautiful young lady. She, uh, uh, she was with us last year. Prior to that, she was a finalist in the Miss Bird Calling competition. Uh, she was written up by the local papers as Mocking the Mockingbird. She's going to do Mimis Polyglottis for us today. Mimis Polyglottis. Mimis Polyglottis. And I'd like you to meet uh, Helen Marguerite Robeson. Helen Robeson. Helen. Good evening. Mimis Polyglottis, the Mockingbird, is a member of the distinctive Mimic Thrush family. Yet, its singular power of mimicry and superior ability of song place the mockingbird in an exclusive class of its own. So ephemeral, the mockingbird's song is a long continued succession of notes and phrases of an enormous variety. It rapidly repeats each phrase a half dozen times or more before going on to the next. Now that it's summer, you may hear this melancholy song of the mockingbird vibrating through the night air. Thank you. I have a feeling Helen's going to be hearing a few calls before long. <laughs> like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely girl. Okay, who's next? Our, our last call is a duet. Uh, uh, we haven't done this call the last two or three years, the Fulmar, uh, Fulmaris uh, Glacialis. That's right. Uh, it's been at least a couple of years. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and also the uh, black uh, petrel. Now, uh, uh, Joanne Allison Frank is going to do the Fulmar, and Adrian Lefebvre is going to do the black petrel. Okay. Since we were little tots, our families have vacationed together on the Commodore Islands. Last summer, while sitting on our back porch, watching the sun setting in the distance, we would hear the sound of wild screeches coming from the ocean. One morning, while walking along the quiet beach, we heard the sound of two birds fighting over breakfast. Knowing that Mr. Waxdeck would be overjoyed by our interest in ornithology, we hurried to see what members of the species they were. Pulling out our handy pocket dictionary for ornithologists, we recognize the Fulmarius glacialis glupitia by its ash gray color and green and yellow bill. The Luminella melania can be identified by its sooty black feathers and brown tail. And now, this is what we heard that morning. Wow! Wow! Ah! 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 Wow! Thank you. 
it's really fascinating. I it's really it. fascinating, and I know that the youngsters work very hard on that, and they do it beautifully. And I think we did this uh, last year. I know we did it the first year, but we had so much fun doing it. So you can thank the youngsters again. Uh, why don't we have them all come out and do all the calls simultaneously together? All at they, one? Yeah, can we have all of them? Okay, there's Brian, James, Helen, Adrian, and Joan. Okay, I, I'll give you a count of three, okay? And on three, everybody... Do your call. You all set? One, two, three. See, if we practice, what could have happened? I tell you, that's a, that's a nice looking group of yeah. youngsters, aren't they? Yes, beautiful. They, they really are. Yeah. That's nice. And nice. And that's fine. <laughs> what? Do, wait a minute. Do, do, wait a minute. You. Do, do. You know what that is? That's the yellow bellied sapsucker in no. heat. <laughs> You're the, in heat. That's the commercial bird. Do. Do, do, oh, do a commercial, yes. Right. <laughs> Remember the sunbird used to sit on the fence? Yes. In the equator? Yes. Go ahead. No, no, I can't do it. <laughs> the key bird up in the, the Alaska. Bird, yes. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Key. key. Yes, it's cold up here. <laughs> Woo. Woo, it's cold. We'll come back with James Coco, <laughs> Kelly Monteith, and Barbara Hauer right after this short day. Remember that bird, don't you? I do. Of course, talk I remember that bird. Too bad all the birds we know we can't talk about all on the television. All the birds we know. The band, the, the guys, I heard them this afternoon, they're doing bird calls. What was that bird they were doing? It was a, a bird from Columbia, the Stickus Cannabis. Stickus ah, Cannabis, yeah. Doing it wonderful. Oh, anyway. Colombian bird. That's right. My next guest, we have not, has not been with us for, what was that? A Kleenex. I have a cold and I just discarded of the Kleenex. Oh, I thought, I just saw that just go over the couch. It went over the other side, nobody can see it. Well, this is not the Collier Brothers apartment, you know. This is a nice... This is a nice place. What is... All right. Well, if I use one, I'll just pile them up here. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> what you just do? You go to somebody's house and just go, honk. Mm. Hi, Harriet. Ready for dinner? Honk, honk. The honk bird. The honk, famous honk bird. <laughs> really neat, yeah. Victoria must be thrilled with you at the house. We you, have dinner, a blubber. Blubber. you have a waste paper basket under there. I do not have one. Well, we'll get you one. I should have something. All you? right. How'd you get your gold? Who the hell knows how you catch your gold? <laughs> well, I didn't go looking for it. I mean, it found me. I have a feeling the cold is always in you. The virus is always in there, and yes. you, you're... Uh, get run down. You get a little run down, and, and it's there, and yes. it takes over. So you that's obviously are weak and run down. Yes, I am. Probably out late doing things you shouldn't do. No, no, that's not that. Just here every night watching this place for you. <laughs> My next... Yeah, it's messy back there. Well, along with the chicken bones and the melon rinds. That, that looks bad back there. My next, My next guest, we have not... Seen, had to leave. We have not <laughs> seen... Wait. He couldn't wait. He's getting tired of this. He wants to come on now. He hasn't been with us for... Many a moon. Longer than that, a couple of years. Uh, fine actor, comedian James Coco is, and he's going to be starring in The Cheap Detective, which is a new Neil Simon movie, opening the 23rd of June. And this fall, he'll be starring in a new play in Broadway called Broadway, Broadway. Oh. What? Just so you won't forget it. Would you welcome James Coco? I was saying this after two years. Somebody told me. I, I don't think it's been that long. Has it been that That's long? That's what they, somebody yeah, said. It two might be. Years. It might be. I've been away. What have you been? I've been doing a lot of movies. I know you've been working. I see you all the time. Working. I was watching the show the other night. You had Tony Randall on, and you were yeah. talking about old radio programs. Right. And I've been going crazy for a couple of days. You remember First Nighter? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. Now it was it was Les Tremaine and who? Graham. Le sorry. Les Tremaine and it was a woman. Does that? I've been First Nighter. Yeah, Les Tremaine. Remember First Nighter? Look, Shirley Temple's in the audience and. 
But I, I can't remember. Who was the guy? Barbara Luddy. Barbara Luddy. Barbara Luddy. Somebody knew. Uh, Bobby Quinn yelled yeah. it out of the booth. Oh, yes. I feel fine. Barbara Luddy. First Luddy. Nighter. Remember that? First and Lux Radio Theater. All those shows. Lux presents Hollywood. Did we used to sit and look at the radio? Yes. You really kind of did. I remember. Did you I'm, just sit around yeah, and just look at the radio? Mm-hmm. When I was growing, you'd sit there and just kind of stare at the radio. I don't know why you were. You just look at it. And turn yeah, the dial was, and watch it. It was marvelous, you know, and it's. It's almost a better medium sometimes than television because your imagination mm-hmm. could do wonderful things. And that's why a lot of things on radio did not transfer very well to television. You know, you could not do lights out yeah, with the on television really effective. The mind is by far yeah, a better... Uh, yeah, yeah. I still love to listen to the radio. Yeah. How you been? I've been terrific. I really have. I'm very excited. I'm going into a new Broadway show with uh, Geraldine Page. I've never worked with her. I'm very... Happy about Fine that. Actress. It's a uh, Terrence McNally play. You know he wrote the Ritz. Right. Bobby Drivers is directing. We're going that in the fall. Uh, got the Cheap Detective coming out, and I'll get all the plugs out of the way. And the movie <laughs> that I just uh, that I did in in Rome with Marcello Mastroianni just won the jury prize at Cannes. So it's been a good year. You work with a lot of good people, which yes. is great because you're great yourself. And I, I suppose you bring everybody up, don't you, when you work with somebody who's really it's it's of a it's certain stature. Uh, it's wonderful to work with those people. I must say that uh, the director of the uh, the film with the Mastroianni, Marco Ferreri, saw me to play in New York where uh, I was eating myself to death. I don't know why I was cast <laughs> in such a role. It was called The Transfiguration of Ben O'Blimpy. And he, he didn't think I did any comedy. He'd never seen me before. Right. So this is a very heavy part, dramatic, very dramatic part. So it was, yeah. it was kind of a nice change. You no, know, it doesn't seem possible. I remember the first time you were on the show. The, you know, this is my hundredth appearance. You're kidding. Tonight is my, well, when I, first, when I did Last of the Red Hot Lovers, you had me on the show. Right. This is the first talk show I ever did. I remember um, you had just you really had done a commercial, yeah. if I remember, and I'm trying to think. Willie the Plumber. It was a plumbing commercial, yeah, Drano, right? Drano, Drano. I was Willie the Plumber. Eat Drano. You know, it's good for your skin or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> Pour it down the sink. and Yes, and I, I was starving. I mean, you know, we were really very, very poor. Were you poor? No, you were never poor. I was not. No, my, I was never poor. No, I mean, we didn't no. even have a radio. We used to go to friends' houses to listen to the radio. I mean, we didn't have a telephone. It was in the candy store. They'd call you us. You didn't even have a radio? No, no. We were really poor. We were, You're we were, talking poor. I mean, I'm really talking yeah. poor. My father was a shoemaker, and not many people had shoes in those days. It was unbelievable. And now, where the, was the, New York? Bronx. Bronx. And the Italian... Yay! Yay! Yes, you're in the Bronx! And, and the Italian bakeries were driving me crazy because they would cook their bread at night. And for some reason, mm. it all came in my window, the smell. Mm. So all night long, I would smell this Italian bread. But I got evening, even because in the morning, they would unload the trucks, you see, with the round loaves of Italian bread. And a bunch of us kids would go down and throw rocks at them. Of course, there was nothing else for them to throw back but the bread. So we'd run like <laughs> hell up the street eating, you know, the, the hot bread. But it was just a terrific Is Does a kid, did you ever steal things? Everything. Yeah. Anything I could lay my hands on. Yeah. I was always caught. I could never steal well. I would go into the five and ten. And I don't know what I would, some terrible junk. And they would catch me and Isn't I would cry funny? and say, I'll never do it again. You know, I, can I still do that. And I, no, I don't. I remember stealing something from a store once. I, never even, I don't think I've ever mentioned this on the air. And I didn't have to steal, but it's one of those things you're a kid and you do dumb things. And it was like in a Woolworths or a five and ten. And picked up some little Mickey Mouse ring from the thing, you know. And furtively, you know. And I was just, just like this, and the manager came up and says, uh, did you take anything? No! You know, and I remember, you deny, you deny, and he threatened to march. He marched me out the back of the store. I can still remember this. My father, who worked for the Consumers uh, Public Power, I went to Nebraska Light and Power, started to walk me to his office. And I, that, that did it right there. And I blurted out the whole thing and showed him the ring, and it's an awful feeling. Humility. I don't know why you don't know even why you take it. I think just be part of the gang. I remember I stole something once and they brought me to my father's store. I, I, I said my father was a shoemaker. And a cop brought me in. Is your th- father a strict? Oh, he threw every shoe in the store at me. No. I mean, he was very sweet with the policeman. Oh, he'll never do it again. He's a good boy, you know, he's a good student, a good boy. And the policeman, he took every shoe in the store and threw it. I was running down the street and the shoes were fine. He was terrific. He really was terrific. Did your dad want you to be a... Did he oh, see more yes. for you than being a shoemaker, or did he say? No, he really thought I made it when I, was, I, when I did a commercial. Yeah. I mean, to him, that was it. Right. I mean, you mean my son selling Drano? I mean, this is it. On you national know, television. On national television, yeah. You folks still living? They're still no. back? Oh, I'm no. Sorry. But they were terrific. Did they come from uh, Italy originally? Yeah, I mean, oh, they, yeah. Italy? Yeah, my, my, um, actually, my mother was from Argentina. Oh. And my father married her when she was 14. Oh, they 14? were 14. 
Beautiful. Beautiful woman. Yeah. He was terrific. Uh, let me do this. We'll okay. be right back. Good to see you again. You too. We'll take a break. Be right back. <laughs> We're back. Welcome to James Coco. <laughs> Little about everything in childhood. You're a native New Yorker, and native yeah. New Yorkers usually. There existed for... Uh, there existed for a lot of years, uh, there's a certain amount of it going on, that uh, chauvinistic attitude, New York versus Los Angeles, which you see disappearing a little bit. Native New Yorkers, you know, used to think Los Angeles was a cultural vacuum, nothing mm -hmm. ever happened, and that, that's... I think that's settling. all changing, isn't it? I, I mean, think so, yeah. theater is becoming very prevalent here. But right. I come to California, and I, I feel that I immediately have to go on a health kick. I know you, you play tennis a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I would rather go to jail than play tennis. <laughs> or <laughs> job, or any. I have never been a very big... You want to go to... No, right to jail. I, right to... Send me to jail. Don't let me jog or anything. You add, And you see with your own eyes the result. I mean, you no. know, it's... Uh, but I hate all of that. They do but get I, on a health food. They kick, really get you. on a health food. So somebody took me to a restaurant. They said, now, this is a, a health food restaurant, and it's wonderful. And I said, okay, I'm willing. And I sat down, and it was outdoors, somewhere on the Strip. You probably know where it is. And uh, they gave me, they served me a big bowl of earth. I swear to you, it was earth. It was, it was shredded wood and pebbles. I mean, it was crunchy, nice. I would have died for a pizza, a good oh, New York yeah. pizza. Yeah, but but it was just earth. It's nice the way you people live out here and eat. And well, everything. I think that they, it's very trendy. It is very yes. trendy here. And yes. uh, shredded grass, the kind you eat, uh, shredded grass on top of the earth. It was wonderful. Alfalfa sprouts and beans sprouts. Alfalfa sprouts and whatever. They, we don't have those in the Bronx. Well, I think you can take anything to extremes, and some people yes. get so carried away with that, it gets a little, yeah, a little ridiculous, you know. Yeah, and people going yummy yum. Isn't this good? Oh, if I, I said, do you have a little ketchup? No, ketchup, bad for you. I said, anything, to, you know, it's just earth. It's just nothing, earth. First thing I do when I get to New York, I start walking. Because yeah. you don't walk out here. That's why you have to yeah. play tennis out here. That's right. You know, you're, it's loitering. If you walk around on the street here, you're they, arrested. They'll, they'll, they'll revoke, <laughs> revoke your feet. Uh, <laughs> so as soon as I get to New York, I start walking around Broadway, yeah. you know, and Fifth Avenue and Madison and so forth. Yeah. And I, as soon as I see one of those sabrette hot dog things with the umbrellas oh. right for that. Oh, the dirty water franks. I mean, this What do you want on? I says, everything you have in those little bins. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And out comes the chili sauce, the mustard, the kraut. Isn't it and you walk good? down the street eating this melange of stuff, and it's wonderful. I, oh, it's, it's wonderful. Really is. Health food notwithstanding. Oh. No, you don't get any earth there. You, I mean, those... Those, those dogs look like they've been lying in a swamp. They have, for about they have, but that's what makes them so tasty, <laughs> right. you know? And I love it because they pick up the sauerkraut with their fingers and just throw it on there. And Want any more of this? Onions, and they do this and they shove it at you and say, and if you don't like it, you know what you can do with it. And, and I love it. I love to be treated like that. I, just, I mean, you know, it's... You know, put me in my place. I don't care. Just don't give me earth to eat, you know, and... Tell me to play tennis and that's, jog. That's part I of, that's part of the that. New York uh, mystique. People love to, to fight adversity. Oh, yeah. They take a pride. Yeah. You know, the, they're on strike. The railroads are broken down. There's no right. transportation. Right. The subway's on Garbage strike. Garbage everywhere. Garbage. Love the, it. The bridges Every don't work. Well, I love it. I oh, can't it's get terrific. to work. It's, yeah. it's, so, it's very clean out here. You know, you walk down the street and there's not, not a newspaper anywhere. You know, in my neighborhood, you kick the dog stuff, doo-doo out of the way. And you, <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, do you know dogs come over from Jersey at night across the bridge just to go in New York? <laughs> I, have, I have, yes, I have proof. <laughs> they come right to First Avenue and they go all the way back to Jersey. <laughs> you know what I found about last time I was in New York, I get in a cab and I want to talk to the driver. But yeah. you can't talk to the driver anymore no. because... In the New York cabs, all of which they, I think, salvaged from the Andre Doria, and they, they have put a, they have put a piece of one quarter inch plastic, oh yeah, which you hardly can see through to yes. protect the driver. You yes. see, and they have a little cup where you put your money in. Right. Now, as soon as you get in the cab, you hear <laughs> the driver turns back. He also has the heater. If there's a heater in the cab, he has it up there. Yes. And in the winter, it can be twenty below zero. He is driving in his, in his skivvies. <laughs> You're sitting back here. Icicles are coming down because the plastic, the heat, does not come oh, yeah. back, and you says, and you can't talk to him because no. you've got this plastic. I'd like to go to, and all you hear is this. 
Now, he doesn't want to talk to you anyway. I mean, That's he right. doesn't want to talk to you I got out of the cab before I came here, and there was a, a, a dog, I mean, bigger than I was, sitting in the front seat. Unfortunately, this cab didn't have a partition. I just sat like this, because I really thought, the, like I'm saying, I'm not going to rob you, I'm not going to hold you up or anything. It's a very nice dog, but I really, could you let me off at of the next corner? Nope, where you got in, we're going to where you wanted to go. And that was it. It's out here? Terrific. No, in New oh. York, you don't have people like that out here. No, when you said this cab out here, oh, that yeah, is no. the cab out here. Yeah, that's that it. Is. And if that cab is busy, that's it. <laughs> One cab. He's busy, forget it. We'll be back. We'll take a break. Uh. Okay. My next guest is a very funny young man. Kelly opens at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas on June 27th. He'll be there through most of July. And currently appearing here in, Los in La Jolla at the Comedy Store this weekend. Would you welcome Kelly Monteith. Kelly? Thank you for that uh, nice welcome. Pleasure to be here. Good looking audience, as always. I feel kind of naked tonight. I got a haircut uh, not too long ago. You know how you feel when you just get one? I was out on the road for about, oh, about two months, and I never get a haircut when I travel. I just don't trust strange barbers. I mean, here's a guy that has a power to alter my appearance. And that's a lot of power to give to a stranger, you know, and I've just learned by experience it's not the best thing to do, man. Ain't no worse feeling when you're sitting in that chair and he starts clipping on your hair and you see his license was issued from Camp Pendleton. <laughs> All done, boot, huh? <laughs> it's one of my rules of the road. I got some. I never shop in a clothing store that uh, can't fit the mannequin right. <laughs> Gotta check the window, man. I mean, if the collar's nine inches back from the, from the neck and the sleeve's too long, don't go in, man. Mannequin don't move. What the hell are they gonna do with you? I learned that the hard way. I used to shop in those places. I was the world's worst consumer. World's worst, man. They saw me coming. Oh, here he comes. Hey, Lou, get out that crap that never sells. <laughs> I'd buy it, boy. Suit with a fly in the back. <laughs> you sure this is right? Yeah, don't worry about it. Just turn it around there when you're ready. <laughs> oh, I believed all that stuff, all those things you told me. It'll press out. It stretches with you. We all believe those. There's one I see in labels, man, I never believe. One size fits all. <laughs> Who are they kidding with that one? Ain't no way I can wear the same sweater that the Incredible Hulk can wear, and it's gonna look right. Unless we wear it together, maybe that's the purpose of it. One size fits all, everybody put it on. <laughs> Might work then, you know. Oh, I take a lot of clothes with me, out of habit mostly. Because when I first started traveling, I lived, practically lived out of my car. And I had everything in there. You know, I was driving all over the country working. Drove all over the country. Saw every part of this country, which is really interesting because it's a beautiful country. It's different in every part that you go to. It's, it's amazing. I'll tell you one thing that's the same, though. It's the things you see in the highway. You always see the same objects in the highway. I don't care what part of the country you're in, you always see the same basic objects in the highway. Big hunk of tire. <laughs> dead possum. <laughs> and one shoe. I swear, that's driven me nuts for years. Where do those things come from? And why only one? They sell shoes in pairs. Why is there only one out there? Is that an impulsive act of some guy driving down the highway? I don't want this lousy shoe anymore. <laughs> I'll keep this one. No, I like this one, boy. But boy, that other shoe ticked me off. I'm glad I threw it up. <laughs> Maybe there's a one-legged wino walking around the country. Every thousand miles. Oh, no, I lost my shoe. <laughs> Oh, it used to torture me when I used to drive. Then one night, I think I figured out where they come from. Honeymoon cars. <laughs> Doesn't that sound logical to you? It's the only thing that seems to make sense to me, man. Because you know that happens. People get married, they tie shoes on a bumper, they take off on a honeymoon, hit a possum, lose a shoe. <laughs> Gotta be it. That problem kept me awake uh, many a long jumps, boy. Because I used to make those long jumps when I was driving, boy. Biloxi to Spokane. <laughs> L.A. to Wichita. You gotta get there. Take anything to stay awake. I'd try all kinds of things to stay awake. Eat Vicks. <laughs> That'd keep me awake, give me a little menthol rush there. Not bad for over the counter, I'll tell you. And I'd chew some phenomint. That, uh... Oh, that works great, that stuff, boy. 
Ain't no way you can go to sleep. You're too busy looking for rest areas. There's gotta be one here soon. Drop a pill once in a while, some guy in a band lay one on me, a Guam turnaround. One of those big uppers. Drop that pill, you can drive to Guam, turn around and come back. And watch the all night movie before you crash. Oh, I stick those, man. Ever go 24 hours without blinking? I swear to God, I used to get so wired on those things, I'd come into towns running alongside the car. Still reading the signs. I used to try and stay awake reading the road signs, but that doesn't help. See, I always thought they could help you out by putting road signs up. They could keep you awake. They try, but they do it wrong. They put up the wrong kind of sign. They'll put that little sign that says, sleepy. You ever see a little sign on the highway, sleepy? That works the opposite. I'd be wide awake, then I'd see that sign, sleepy. Well, I hadn't thought about it. But... <laughs> now that you mention it, man, I'm out. <laughs> Fell asleep and killed himself, damn fool. Didn't he see that sign? <laughs> so that doesn't work. But they could keep you awake with road signs. They could. Just think how lurked you'd become if you saw a road sign sniper area. <laughs> Our late and late at night, we had in the middle of nowhere. Caution, werewolf crossing. <laughs> I didn't know those were real, man. Oh, there's a full moon. Oh, God. Don't have a flat. Please don't have a flat. They do have some real signs that get your adrenaline pumping pretty good. You know, those signs like, wrong way. <gasps> How the hell did I do that? I'm so glad they don't have signs like that in life. Wrong way. Oh, no. 30 years. <laughs> Dead end, I know, I know. <laughs> Don't remind me. Then you got those signs I know had to be put up by drunk traffic engineers. Had to be. Those guys get in a room with about four bottles of scotch and start drinking and designing, and four hours later, they're wiped out. Hey, I got an idea. Let's get them going 85 in the fast lane, then we'll put this sign up. Lane ends in 10 feet. <laughs> Funny, funny. Then I guess it was supposed to be, wasn't it? Of course. So. You don't come out here to sing. Well, we'll do this. We'll be right back. Funny, of course it's supposed to be funny. I was just talking to Kel here, and uh, congratulations on order. When did you get married? You just recently married. How about two months. Ah. About two months I've been married now. You finally, the girl you've been going with for some time? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we've been going, but I think that's why it seems like it's not such a big drastic change, because yeah. we've been going together about six years, and we're kind of realistic about it. You know, we six no longer have that running going? slow motion through a meadow kind of relationship, you know, which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we do on occasion, you know, but that's, that's the nice part of it. So we finally, uh, we've been working on it a long time, we finally decided to take a shot. Yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons, when you go with somebody for a while, you get into that situation where when you introduce somebody, you, this is my friend, it's not, it's not your fiancé, it's not my... You, oh, that was so frustrating. I never knew what to... Uh, Diane and I have been going together six years. I never knew what to say. This, my girlfriend, it sounded like we're pinned. Right. You know, came from the prom, my girlfriend. Fiance. My fiancé, I don't think that works. Because no. they say, oh, when's a wedding? Well, I hadn't thought about it yet. <laughs> so I guess just my friend, my uh, companion. Is my lady, I used to say my lady, but that sounds like she's on a leash. That's yes. right. <laughs> Your lady, your lady. Yes. Lady, right? Heel, heel. Hurry up your lady there. Okay. <laughs> well, so how do you like it after two months? Uh-huh. Uh it seems to be going well. I did everything, man. I jumped in full, full blast. I, uh, I got married, uh, got a house, and have a son. <laughs> My wife has a son from uh -huh. a previous marriage, hopefully previous. Uh, so you, you, inherited, you inherited a child along with it? I'm a stepfather, which is not a word I like. You know, I, that I don't always know... sounds uh, something that's uh, illegal. It does. I don't know why. It's a stepfather, like a bootlegger or something. Well, the... <laughs> I suppose I it why. is, in a sense. <laughs> yeah. But my uh, I, fairy tales, the, the wicked parent was always a step-parent. Remember that? It was yes. a wicked stepfather, the evil stepmother, which I suppose was a subtle indictment for divorce, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I, 
I guess that's what I am. But it's in a... How old is the boy now, does he? He's 12. He's 12. So I can kind of relate to 12. Now, Six, I wouldn't know. What he doesn't call you dad, so I suppose he calls no. you... No, he calls me... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> How does he call me, anyway? <laughs> it's tough for a kid, you know, to be on a first name hey, basis when he's 12. It is. Yeah. I, I don't think... I couldn't be... I have to discipline, I suppose. I suppose yeah, I do. Sure. I hate to say that parents probably go, oh, boy, what is he getting into? But I have to I'll be, I have to do that now. It's going to be hard for me. I've never done that before. Well, you're in, you're in for a remarkable experience. Really? Yeah. I have to be consistent, though. I don't want to be one of the... Go to your room. No, wait. Uh, 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 you drink? Come here. Uh, a little shot in the beer there. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's tough to, to talk on their level because then, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's tough at the same time to talk to them as an adult because you're in two different wavelengths. So it's but this... I can remember being 12. Yeah. Yeah. Spent most of the time in the bathroom, I think. Lots of, yes. <laughs> good portion of the time. Hiding out. That had been for the draft. I think I'd still be in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Barbara Hauer will, <laughs> will join us in just a moment. Barbara Hauer, my next guest, is uh, a writer, television personality. Barbara's an observer and participating in the Washington scene, and she's always has some interesting things to tell us. Would you welcome us, Barbara Hauer? tonight. I'm all right, thank you. Well, anything late-breaking developments in Washington we don't know about? Oh, nothing that we can get into now. There are no really major scandals like there were a few years ago, were there? Well, nothing that we can get into now. What do you mean? <laughs> well, I don't really know of any, but oh. if you think about Washington long enough, you always know it's like a bus. Another one will come along in a few minutes. Really? <laughs> yeah. Somebody gave me a quote that you once, once said, and I want to check it out because I'm not sure what it means. It says, if you were a man, you would probably be a a pig. Does that mean a, chauv a chauvinistic, uh, is that what yeah, that meant, a chauvinistic I guess, male? I, I guess I said that, huh, Johnny? I yeah, I'd be I a did. pig, and I didn't know well, exactly. Well, about, about ten years ago, when the women's movement was first starting, I thought to myself, if I were a man, I'd probably oink once in a while. I don't think it's, it's human nature to abdicate power and authority the way the white male has had to do over the last 10 or 20 years. You know, he's had minority groups saying, move over and give me a slice of the pie. And then all of a sudden, this great majority group comes along women who say, hey, I want my, my turn too. And I think if I'd been a man... You think that threatens the, the male uh, virility or what? Well, I think it threatened them more 10 years ago than it does now. I think there are a lot of men who feel much better that they're independent women because they don't feel so put upon. And there are some men and some women who will never have it any other way than the traditional way. There's some men who just simply can't quite deal with a woman who's wildly independent. So if those women who really like to be dependent can get with the men who like women to be dependent, then I think we've got it licked. I, you myself, am betwixt and between. Think that will ever work out? I think it will. I, I tend to think it's working better now. I, I don't find that men are as threatened. Certain men are not as threatened by independent women as they were five years ago, two years ago, 20 minutes ago. E yeah. Each time it goes on a little longer. It seems to get better. You don't feel threatened. I mean, well, you're not threatened by anybody of any color, any sex, because you, professionally, because you kind of have your terrain staked out. But there are men. This is my nesting ground. <laughs> I, this is my, I have a nesting instinct. This is my desk. This is my microphone. And Ed's been cluttering it up. No, but I don't think, uh, I don't think you strike me as someone who'd be threatened by women. We had a gentleman the other night, Monty Vanton, who had written a book. It was, kind of, it was called Marriage Grounds for Divorce. And uh, he made one interesting statement. It was kind of fun. But he says, women get married, and then they say very often, and I don't say always, because I hate that's a bad word, always. Someone will say to the husband, you have a fascinating job. You leave the house, and you go out every day, and you meet all these glamorous, fun people and so forth, and I'm stuck here at home. And he says, when a woman goes out, she says, I I'm not free to pursue my career. He says, did you notice all women always say my career? Where a man, he goes to a job. <laughs> but with a woman, it's a career. And it was an interesting point. I don't know. I think that there are a lot of women now who've come to the conclusion that the whole idea was to have the choice, to be able to go out and have a career or a job. And now that the choice is there by law or by the fact that it's become accepted, they're having pretty good time staying home. I, I'm, I'm beginning to think maybe I could stand a, you know, drive a carpool and live in the suburbs and marry a rich, proc rich proctologist or, you know, just, you get awfully tired of being out on the firing line all the time. And I think there are a lot of women who are beginning to see that maybe 
You know, as long as you have the choice, as long as you could do it if you wanted to, as long as you don't have to, it's not so bad. Yeah, but a lot of people don't have that option, do they? Doesn't it depend if your husband, uh, as you say, is affluent enough so that the wife can go pursue a career? That's right, and there are a lot of people who are women are out working simply because they need to bring on that extra income, and they don't find that a career. They find that hard and tough, and and they're, uh, you know, a much maligned group of women because they're out there, you know, uh, subsidizing the family income, and they don't find it a right. They find it a necessity. Right. Have you ever had, uh, have you ever been in a job and you handle, have to handle, handle failure? Oh, God, Johnny. Like day and night, failure. But f failure is a funny word because usually it means that somebody else looks at what you've done and says you haven't done it well. And so I don't like to think of it as failure. But I've had lots of disappointments where I haven't done as well as I thought I was going to do. And I hate them, and they happen to me all the time. It makes me a lot more humble. I must say that I, I get more sensitive to other people's fears and shortcomings when I have what is commonly called a failure. And it, the, the bad thing about it is that it keeps you from taking any chances. If you fail a couple of times, you don't want to go out and try something new because you think, you know, God, I can't go through that again. The fear of failure. The fear of failure. And what is life if you don't take any risks? So the whole thing that's bad about failure is that it keeps us all safe. People who don't take risks with their lives, I think must be very unhappy people. I think I'd rather fail than not have tried, not have taken the risk yeah. at all. Nothing. Somebody was talking about it. <laughs> so I, I saw a show some other night where some woman was um, bemoaning the fact that the lack of women in high political office in this country and women would be different if they were in office than men. And, and I think the man's reply was probably not because once the women got in and got that power and got in the, the pol political arena, they would be subject to all of the temptations, the temptations and, well, we wouldn't be asking. and the compromises that men have and might end up doing exactly what men do. Oh, I think women are as intelligent and as able to be as corrupted as men. We just haven't had that much opportunity. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, that is only human nature, right. is that power corrupts, but we haven't had much of a shot at it. At least one thing you can be certain of, if there were women who were running political conventions, they wouldn't be sending out for booze and girls, you know, there would be, it would be different in that respect. Mm. Would you ever run for political office? No, I never would run for... I can't imagine anybody wanting me to run for no. political office. My, my, uh, I just don't have that much hypocrisy in me. I really don't. I'm not very good at kissing Fanny, and I think that's practically what it takes to run for political office. Just a certain amount of compromise. Yeah, a certain amount of compromise. Yeah. That's a real compromise right there. But you've got to, you've got, you never can say exactly what's on your mind. You know, you've got to always be terribly conscious of what somebody's thinking about you and whether you're going to offend somebody. Has anybody ever tried that running for political office? Coming out and saying exactly what is on their mind and not playing the game. You I probably can't, wouldn't get elected. I can't think. It only happens in situation comedies or in movie scripts where the guy comes out and says, you know, this is the way it is and calls the shot as it is. But you don't really get elected that way. You get elected by slowly sort of collecting promises and doing for other people and selling yourself to the public and kissing a lot of fannies. Do you think that anything really changes in the long run in the country? I mean, the, there, there are small changes along the way, but nothing really big seems to change from, from election to election or from change of administration to administration. I don't think so. I think what people do is, particularly after something like Watergate, where there was a whole lot of, you know, pointing of fingers and a lot of people being indicted, is that the corruption continues. It's just that you're just a lot more careful about it, you know, that you just watch yourself. <laughs> That's but rather an indictment, it's, isn't it? Yeah, it's rather an indictment. It's a sad indictment. But I just don't think that, what is it, uh, H.L. Mencken that said to quest the honest politician is as unthinkable as questing the honest burglar. And sometimes I think maybe there was more to it than cynicism when he said that. Before long, there'll be something really spicy coming out of Washington, I suppose. I'll be here to you'll give have, you the You'll word. have the inside track. Yeah. Kelly, uh, happy luck on your marriage. Thank you very much. And you open uh, when? 27th of June at the Aladdin Hotel. I and James, uh, the chief detective, Neil Simon's movie, and uh, when's Broadway, Broadway. When's that open? It opens in September. I hope Geraldine Page, I hope Terrence McNally, Robert Drivers. Terrific show. Smash. Come see it. Thank I will. You. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll take a cab, one of those New York cabs over there. Uh, Monday night, Burt Reynolds is going to be here. And uh, he's going to have with him Carol Burnett, James Brolin, Roger Miller, and Victor Buono. Have a nice weekend. We'll see you.
I'm humbled by that applause.